Howdy. Welcome back to Dion Talk. I like to do my deal deep delves and talk about deals that people are buying right now during the pandemic, during the eviction moratorium. But today I've got a special deal deep delve I want to do because it's completely relatable to what we're dealing with now. After 2008, housing prices crashed, went down a large percentage, and there was a lot of deals for sale. Properties were super cheap, but almost nobody wanted to buy because banks were harder to get lending from, and people didn't know how far properties were going to drop. Around 2013, most home, most markets, the housing prices went above where they were in 2008. So a lot of people started calling for a crash, saying that this is unsustainable. Prices are higher than they were in 2008 when we had the last crash, which was not caused by the prices. It was caused by ninja loans, adjustable rate mortgages, people borrowing more than they should, getting 105% financing. Then those adjustable rates kicking in when they couldn't refinance to get out of it. The secondary mortgage note market was, was had packaged deals together of really bad mortgages. So there was a bunch of things that caused that crash and it wasn't home prices. Since 2013, people have been saying, don't buy rental properties, prices are going to crash. Wait for the crash, wait for the correction. In 2020 and 2021, we have things like a pandemic and uh, an eviction moratorium. And right now, prices are continuing to go up and people are saying, don't buy, there's a crash coming. Don't buy, there's a correction coming. In 2019, Jeremy purchased a house. In 2019, when prices were going up and everybody was saying, don't buy because they're going to correct, prices are way higher than they were in 2008. And you may remember Jeremy came on and shared his story. He is a Navy veteran that is, has used the strategy of house hacking with eight kids to build a portfolio about the same size as mine, where I did it in 10 years. They've done it in about three and a half. So Jeremy, let's Delve deep into this deal that you got in 2019. Can you tell me, how did you find this property? What we did was we purchased a house uh, in a market that was definitely strong and growing. It was still affordable. Uh, it's a, uh, I would call it a B house in an A plus neighborhood. Um, some of the best schools in the state, walking distance to those schools into town. Very, very good neighborhood. Lots of stability in, in the job market here. Uh, we purchased this home with a VA loan. Uh, we purchased the property for $205,000. And it's a little over 2,200 square feet. It's got a, a beautiful back deck to it. The back deck is has built-in seating. It's about um, 800 square foot. Two-car garage, 1991, 92 build, somewhere in there. We purchased it and we moved into it uh, with me and all our kids. And we loved it. but it needed uh, quite a bit of work. I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So over the course of a year, we ended up completely renovating the house, carpet, floor, paint, appliances. Um, I even ripped out uh, the, the kitchen uh, myself. And uh, it was a great learning experience <laughs> and put in quartz. And uh, we just made a, a showcase home, a beautiful, beautiful home. So during the pandemic, what we decided to do was buy a, a larger home. So we found one that was 50% uh, larger. And then it hit me that uh, you know, our, our payment was so low that we could actually continue to have that house and to rent it out. That's what kind of started the ball rolling. My, my strategy came to life and eventually it became a full-time job for me. But the, uh, the house now rents for... Uh, 2300 uh, and next year it'll rent for probably 25 or 27 uh, once the uh, the tenant leaves I don't really have anything to do with the property other than get the the ACH deposit every month I think my PITI um, in there I actually refied uh, right before we purchased uh, another home and I got it down to 2.25 so we're like 841 on PITI I Threw some extra cash at it too, so um, nice spread between eight forty one and and twenty three hundred, and so that that's kind of been you know our model as we've as we purchased. And when you did the refi, it was a rate and term. You didn't pull any money out. No money out. In fact, I put some in. Yeah. Okay. I think that's smart. A lot of people, and I'm kind of being 
peer pressured into looking at doing a cash out refinance by Michael Zuber and Matt, the lumberjack landlord, because they have recycled capital and their portfolios are much larger than mine. Their cash flow is better than mine. So I know that they probably have a better idea than me. So I'm still struggling mentally with that one. I had Mindy Jensen from Bigger Pockets come on and talk about her strategy that she is called a live in flip. So she purchased a house like you did. She moves in. She goes through the construction zone of the next year to get the house where she wants it. She lives there for two years and then she sells because you, with the IRS 121 rule, you can realize up to $500,000 in capital gains and pay no taxes on it as long as you're married. 250 if you're single. So your strategy seems like a live-in burr. You moved in, exactly. you rehabbed, you did a refinance to get a better rate, which was smart. I bought some places in 2018, 2019. I've refinanced since then too to get, I think it was 5.5% interest down to 3.125% interest. Didn't take any money out, just got my payment down lower too. Unfortunately, the first home that we tried to buy here, uh, the appraisal for the uh, VA loan did come in too low and we tried to meet them halfway, but they didn't want to do it. So we ended up actually staying in a basement in Amish country for, I, it must've been a month or two. And it was miserable. It was not fun. Um, but we kept persevering. Um, we had pressure from family to rent. The, the first home that we purchased, uh, it ended up just being an absolute lifesaver. So, you know, that time in the basement was really worth it. Um, it, it you know, sometimes it can be a little bit stressful, but um, real estate has allowed me to be closer to my family. Uh, obviously, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that once you have a large, large family, it's almost impossible to do anything but be an entrepreneur or an investor or tradesman. Yeah. What, what yeah. is the end so, goal with investing? That is, that's a great question. Um, after the first one, we, uh, we looked at it and I said, you know what? I want to give a house to every one of my kids um, at some point in their lives. And so you know, our first house is named Jane for my oldest daughter. And then we're just kind of working down the list. And uh, I would love to give them all a super nice A plus house. Uh, I think that would be an amazing way. I mean, they could rent it. I don't care, you know, but I think that would be really uh, an awesome legacy to leave for my family. Um, I also want to have a couple more that cash flow just for me and my wife through retirement and that type of thing. Um, and you know, right now with the, with the B minus and C plus homes that I'm, I'm purchasing, it may take recycling a couple of those homes to get all A plus houses. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm willing to do the work to get it done. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's fun. It really is. And it's a good goal. I think that, that is an amazing goal. Family. I really like Brandon Turner. Turner's method of buying a fourplex when his daughter was born uh, on a 15 year mortgage. He's benefiting from the cash flow while they have it. When that kid is around the age of going to college, he'll do a full cash out refinance because the property will be paid off. So he'll take that money, that's her college fund or trade school fund or whatever investing fund that she's going to use it for. He still owns the asset, he still is going to have the cash flow. So there's several ways to do it. I make them mow my, my lots, uh, vacant lots and, uh, you know, our properties if they need turned over and stuff. So they're working for it too. You know, I've got my little, my little Navy out here. And if any of my kids are watching this, I'm probably going to give you a property too. But not today. How you found this deal on the MLS or? Yeah. Yeah, so this one popped up um, on the MLS. We were in it in a day, um, less than a day. I offered on it on the staircase, which is exactly how I do all my deals, it seems like, before I leave. Um, and then uh, we got it for 205000 We had an inspection, uh, a private inspection, go through, and they found that there was a small crack in one of the furnaces that was leaking some carbon monoxide. So luckily, my inspector wrote in his description, he said a higher than normal amount of carbon monoxide. And he didn't say dangerous or um, harmful, but that gave us the leverage to get 15,000 at closing for a brand new HVAC, uh, the, the whole works. And there was also some other things that, that were not perfect about the home that they conceded to us, um, mostly because they understood they had lived there, you know, almost 30 years or 
maybe over. And, uh, you know, they knew that there was some work that needed to be done and I was willing to do that work. So, um, yeah, that was, it was a, it was a great deal. Now looking at the property and our values here, that home is probably worth 350,000, I would say. And, um, we actually put solar on, on that house, which uh, I know Lumberjack Landlord and a couple people on YouTube say, don't do that unless you're in California and you have to. But it actually worked out really well in Indiana for us because essentially on our Indiana tax record, what they do is they credit you for the full value of the solar. Um, and they, they say it rose the value of the home by, let's say, 30000 Then they give you a deduction for 30000 But every year as the cost of energy goes up, they adjust that deduction. So for instance, this last year, my deduction went up by 9.8% as the cost of energy went up in our area that way. So in some regards, it is an appreciating asset. And then it allows me to um, tell them that previously our electricity was 350 to $450 a month. And I'm covering that for them, but the payment on the solar is less than $200. Um, it, so yeah, it's, it's, some people don't like solar, but I'm actually planning on doing it, doing it on all of my property. It makes sense. One thing I really like about what the inspector did is if you're getting a VA or an FHA or an owner occupied type of loan, the property needs to be basically live in ready. So had the inspector used the terms, dangerous or harmful, it might have stopped the lending from going through until that was fixed. But by wording it the way that they did, like I do, you were able to use your in your inspection report and the terminology in it to negotiate the price down. And since you were using a VA loan, you actually walked away from the table with money. And in mine, I'm usually taking off $10,000, um, which has an impact, but it's spread out over the length of the loan. So off the MLS, owner-occupied funding using VA, so FHA would work as well. You turned it into a rental. What's the long-term goal for this property now? Um, we really love this house. Um, I think we're going to try to hold it as long as we possibly can uh, and just continue to cash flow it. Um, at some point, I'm going to HELOC uh, the, the home once we have, uh, you know, um, maybe, maybe in another year or two, we'll HELOC that particular one. You're going to do a home equity line of credit once you have the equity, maybe a cash out refinance, depending on what weirdness happens with the rates. I know some people think they're going to go up. I think they might go down to zero. Germany went to negative rates. We, my crystal ball is out of reach. So we don't know what's going to happen. You also have the exit strategy of one of your kids is going to be gifted the property at some point. That's, that's correct. And, you know, it, it had crossed my mind before I did a, uh, uh, a refinance on the, on the property to get to a 2.25 that, uh, you know, we had owner occupied it pretty recently and you know, maybe we'll just do it for a year or two and then, you know, pull our cash out of it. But honestly, it's getting a cash flow so well for so long that it, it makes absolutely no sense to, to get out of that house. So we've named it Jane and it will remain that way. Nice. And to go over the cash flow really quick, I think I got the numbers right. Your PITI is less than 900. Mm -hmm. Your current rent is like 2,200? Uh, 20, 23, actually. 20, 23. 20. And it's going to go to 27. Mm -hmm. So 23 to 9. So 1,200 in cash flow minus CapEx, maintenance, and vacancy. You're probably cash flowing about 900 bucks on that one problem. Um, so I've had no vacancy. <laughs> well, I, I just um, set aside like 5% in my mind. Yeah, I, said, I would say, yeah, I'd say 5% It would be fair. Um, with that one, we had it rented while I was still renoing the kitchen. Um, I was like, imagine a kitchen here. And, uh, you know, I had the plans and everything. And they kind of had to trust that I would do it within a time frame. And I, I actually, uh, I got right to the time frame of the, of, of the contract within the day. Um, so it was, it was a pretty close call, but, you know, um, with labor shortages, the way they were, I had to find somebody to help me find, uh, lift about 800 pounds worth of quartz. Um, and eventually a neighbor did. Um, so yeah, that was, was pretty interesting, um, right there, but yeah, um, I would say, yeah, probably about 900. 
um, we we're probably not going to have much turnover in that in that home. Um, also, it has all new mechanicals. Um, I redid quite a bit of the plumbing. I had a lot of um, help with uh, redoing some of the electrical as well. And um, you know, it's brand new toilets, stoves, sinks, everything. I, I don't see a lot going wrong. Knock on wood with that home anytime soon. Um, so yeah, we probably won't have much capital expenditure, you know, next year or two, hopefully. So a, a really good takeaway for newer investors is a question that comes up to me often is what do you do if you have a vacancy for an extended period of time? And, you know, what do you do if you just don't have rent coming in? And that's never been the question as an investor, like you did, my two tenant turnovers I've had in 10 years, I struggled to think, how am I possibly going to get anything done before the next tenant wants to move in? One time I had a four day turnaround. So it was like from December 26th until the end of December. So by January, that person was moving in and that place needed a bit of work. The previous tenant had been in there like four years. Like your experience, I had multiple offers. I, I it was rented at 1130. I listed at 1800. I had 12 applicants within four hours and people saying, I can pay extra. I can pay a bigger security deposit. How do I put myself to the top of the list? So I don't, there's no way to get a newer investor past the fear of I might have a vacancy because that's a real concern. So you have some reserves, but it's not how long will the property be empty? That's not the question to ask. The question is how much lower would I have to take a rent before somebody wanted to move in now? And in most cases right now, that rent number just keeps going up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. I, that, that is not one of my fears. I have people who contact me daily saying, Hey, I still need a home. And, uh, you know, we, we showed that property in August um, and they're still looking for a larger home. Um, there is such a demand out there for, for anything that um, you, you'll, you'll find a way to make it work. Um, you know, and I know, uh, we had, uh, in my local real estate investment group, we had a lot of folks that, um, they were just waiting for their renters to get out so that they could put furniture in an Airbnb it. Uh, that seems to be coming up as a huge popular model in our area. And in fact, I'm currently Airbnb, Airbnb my next door neighbor's house for him while he's in Florida. He's a snowbird. Um, and it's cash flowing really well, um, I think we're looking at $6,000 a month and I'm taking a quarter of it. So it's a nice little part-time job just to accept people. And um, yeah, we have it kind of automated with cleaners and lawn care. And uh, so yeah, not a ton to be done with a, a long, longer term Airbnb. It's, it's, a, it's a good model. That's beautiful. And what's great about that is your neighbor is happy. Right. Oh, he's very happy. He's you're helping him making... you're, even though you're profiting, they're happy that you're doing it. So that is an awesome strategy. I like that. Yeah. 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 That house was going to sit until August of next year. And having a house sit in the winter in Indiana is not a smart, smart idea. And so uh, it was either he was going to pay people to take care of the place or he's going to pay somebody to just be in it. You know, or he's going to be paid for somebody to be in it. I think that's a much better model. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Cool. So thank you for sharing the details of this deep delve. I like the idea of reminding people that as prices are going up and a lot of YouTube channels get clicks because they say there's a crash coming or there's a correction coming, so don't buy now, that the longer you wait to buy a property, the more you're going to pay. If somebody wants to reach out with any questions, Jeremy, how can they get a hold of you? Easiest way is Jeremy Kirkwood on Facebook. Just message me. I'm wearing a suit and there's a uh, green shack in the background. Again, thanks a lot, Jeremy. I'm hoping that the information you're sharing can at least help somebody, maybe two somebodies. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. I had known that it would be up. Oh. Howdy. <laughs> Can you say hi? Hi. Do <laughs> you need me to turn on your show? Yeah. What do you want to watch? Uh, yeah. Okay, PBS Kids it is. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. So we were talking exit strategy, right? Yep. I'm, okay. I'm wondering how many people noticed before right now that there was a baby in your lap <laughs> through this video. <laughs> It's going to be awesome if you put that at the end. It, it'll be this. It'll be edited down to probably about a minute and a half. But you'll, you know, your son will come in and you'll get up with the baby and they'll be like, "There's a baby there." <laughs> so, perfect. <laughs> I love it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I enjoy doing the after credit fade yeah. to black and then something else pops up. Um, yeah, it feels like yeah. it didn't have to end. You know.